welcome to Word Time. This is Coach Shelby with Coach for Christ. And I pray that after week one, all you tremendous football coaches out there have a victory under your belt. But let me tell you something. I wasn't referring to the scoreboard. I was referring to the scoreboard in heaven. Amen. Talking about the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm talking about making an imp impact. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's about even making a sacrifice here uh, for the things that the world says are success that they may find success eternally. And you may not understand that, um, but I know some of you do. And so I'll leave it right there with that. Praise God. Again, this is Coach Shelby with Coach for, for Christ. And I think most guys on here um, did find that victory on both scoreboards. The others are still looking for one on the one on earth. You'd rather be looking for one on earth than in heaven. You got to get that one secured. But I want to recap uh, game one for us. And I'm just going to talk to you for a little bit. And then I'll share a few verses at the end. And uh, the first thing is, is that we went out to Waxahachie uh, with our season opener this year. We wound up playing a school out of Houston. And uh, uh, lo and behold, it's uh, it's really hard, difficult for us to find preseason games. Some of you may understand that. I, I don't know exactly why, but uh, it is. So that's what we did this year. And uh, I'm going to be honest. Um, it's real hard as a coach to go into a situation. And, you know, there's a certain amount, uh, whether it's there or whether it's perceived of arrogance, uh, whenever you play different folks and for whatever reason, whether it means that uh, they think that uh, they've got a little more faith than you got, or a little more talent than you got, or whatever it is, pride always comes before a fall. And I'm not saying anything about our opponent in that fashion. I'm telling you the things that, that I have to guard against. And so, um, when we went in for the pregame, it's real easy to give a, a rah rah um, speech in which I usually give them a word before we go out. And I'm talking about a word from God's word, something that's real, not something that's fake and made up and uh, gets the senses and emotions going for a minute, but it fades and dies when adversity hits. See, the word of God will last when adversity hits. And even though there may not be any football in heaven, uh, this is the sport that God has given us to teach these lessons. And I kind of see football as like the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament with types and shadows, the battles, they literally happened. But they were for our advantage to see the warfare that we would have in the spirit realm. See, there's no, there should be no divider between the Old and the New Testament. I do not believe that you can properly understand the new until you understand the old. And I believe that in my life. And I think that's the vision that God has given me that he's shown me through athletics and through football, particularly one of the most difficult sports we have, uh, carrying around the pads and the heat and whatnot, that this is a type and a shadow. If we can endure this, if we can push through this of what we're to do in the spirit. So we come together and, uh, our pregame word was on the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to paraphrase all of that. Nehemiah, you know, was the King's cupbearer. You know, that, he, uh, his job was basically to drink the, the, the drink and, uh, eat the food. And if he didn't drop dead, then it was safe for the King. What a job. And he did it with a joyful heart, but he had a burden on his heart that the King noticed and God had given him favor to go back and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And when he went back to rebuild the wall, um, the people had a mind to work. They were encouraged because the wall was symbolic of strength. It was protection of the city. Now I'm going to tell you something that you probably never saw it from this angle. But walls are made to keep the enemy out. They even put a watchman on the wall. Coaches, you're a watchman. You're a watchman for your teams, that you're a watchman for your family. And watchmen pray. And watchmen tune in their dial to the Spirit of God. You see, the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8. That's what watchmen do. But watchmen also watch over their teams. You see, you're showing those young men right now, those ladies, you don't know how many young ladies are watching. You don't know how many parents are hearing the testimony from their sons and daughters back to their homes. You don't know the number of people that are being touched that you never really fellowship with on a day-to-day -day basis because God's word knows no bounds. God's word is, is refuses to do a void work. It shall accomplish what it is called to do. But that wall, that you're a watchman on top of, according to Ezekiel. That wall is not only to keep the enemy out and to keep a lookout and for protection for those that God has given you. You see, that wall may represent keeping the filthy music, the rock music that you're listening to. You can't share a word, kneel down and pray and listen to hell's bells. 
You can't do that. And if you do, then you've got lukewarm water, which God says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be hot or cold. You see, we got to be on one side or the, or the other. So we're, we are the watchman on the wall and we got to keep some things out of our program. We got to keep something that we can't follow people around everywhere they go. God has given them free will. But while they're under our jurisdiction, while they're under our uh, leadership, then we teach these things in hopes that the convicting power of God will come upon them. And when they leave, they will remember. Coaches, it may be 10, 15 years later. That wall protects from the enemy and you've got to build it. But that wall also is made to keep some things in. Did the Lord not say to protect your heart, to guard your heart? How do we guard our hearts? I just gave you an illustration of that. We look at what we, 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 we make a covenant with our eyes is what Job said, or what I will and will not entertain or look at. We keep some things in and we keep some things out. Praise God. I'm just going to stop and let that marinate just for a second. But when this wall was being built, which was our pregame word, you see, many of them had a sword in hand while the others built. They had to be on lookout. We build this wall one brick at a time. We put the brick in the wall. We put the mortar in the wall, and we have a mind to work. But when this was taking place, you'll read about a man called Sanballat. Well, Sanballat in Babylonian means sin. You see, many times when you're building those walls and you're standing on the wall as a watchman, according to Ezekiel, you'll begin to get grow weary. You know, you see, we're great out of the gate, but we're not much for endurance sometimes. And it's in that endurance that God has called you, that faith, that patience, that proves what you really believe. It's in the adversity that proves what you really believe. So we're great out of the gate, but then we begin to hear the word of the flesh. We begin to hear that talking in our head. As my brother Coach Ryle says, the man on each shoulder, one telling you to do, do right, one telling you to do wrong. One is the flesh, one is the spirit. We, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And yet we wrestle against ourselves. In Exodus 15, 3, it says, God is a God of war. And I'm here to tell you that he's come to declare war against your sin nature. We try to talk ourselves out of the call of God. We meditate and marinate too long in that which is not of God because the word of God is supposed to be first place in our life and we should be constantly renewing our minds. So we stand and we build with sword in hand and the sword represents the word of God. So as we were putting another brick in the wall on Friday night, we were running with sword in hand. We're not here to kill. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're here to bring, to resurrect the dead to life that through our testimony, that somebody on another team may be saved, that a coach may repent, that they may put their trust and faith in Yeshua. We carry sword in hand. We're going to go and knock the taste out of somebody's mouth. And then we're going to say, bless the Lord, praise God, brother, help you up. I'll be right back. Because see, if we come in there limp-wristed and half-hearted, and we don't bring the talents according to Matthew 25 that God has told us to bring, then what kind of, of, of commitment is that? What is that all about? You see, it's not about your size. It's not about your status, where you come from. It's not about your money. It's not about the clothes you wear. It's about who you're clothed in and who has filled you. And I'm talking about the spirit of the living God. I'll tell you one of the greatest blessings, and Coach Ryle, man, thank you for sharing that Saturday. What a blessing to come out. What, what threw us off when you begin to see the fruit of what many are sowing into those that God has given. We come out, and Coach Ryle wasn't sure whether it was Billy Graham, but his show sounded like Billy Graham to me. And so we're in the tunnel ready to run the field, and we got Billy Graham blasting the gospel the good news of Yeshua, him crucified, risen from the dead. Repent, put your trust and faith in him. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You can play your hell's bells. You, you can play your secular music. You can play your garbage. But I'm going to tell you what, there's life in the gospel. There's life in the word of God. And we came out to that. And I'm going to tell you what, man, that's moving. That's moving. And I'm going to tell you what, when you learn that the word of God being sown, because even though some may not have liked it, may not have understood, the word will not return to God void. You see, we're broadcasters. Maybe some of you have a, a fancy yard. You're trying to win yard of the month, and you broadcast fertilizer and seed on your yard from time to time. I'm a broadcaster. I'm a farmer. The sower sows the word, Mark 4, 14. So we're spreading word continually. And it don't matter. 
It don't matter who does or who does not want to hear. This planet, this this all of creation declares his glory. The heavens and earth were created by God and for God. And he has put us as stewards. He put Adam and Eve as stewards in the garden. He said, rule, reign, tend it under the lordship of Yeshua, under the leadership that I be led by the Holy Spirit, I shall speak the word of God. You just don't know how many years later, how many months, how many days. You don't know that that seed, like a, like a piece of chicken in a man's tooth that he's got to pluck out, you don't know that that seed may implant in the soul and cause great turmoil. It might even cause some swelling and some inflammation. It may cause some irritation. It may cause some, some conviction that in the end, that young man or young lady may repent. Preach the gospel. Speak the word of God. Teach your kids to speak the word in every situation. Why is it so easy for us when frustration sets in on the, on the game field to say a curse word versus to say a, a, a word of God? How much more power is in the word of God. You see, the enemies tried to strip the sons and daughters of God by convincing them that this is the word to speak, which brings a curse, but I speak the word that brings a blessing. The blessing of the word of God. And one of the things that we tell our guys, and I talk about in class, two things, which is the same thing, just a different way to remember it. Be on purpose. God has given you something called a free will. To be on purpose. To be on purpose with that free will make a decision. You see, God never intervenes with your free will. He tugs at it with something called conviction by the Holy Spirit, but he never forces your hand. Be on purpose and make a decision. And I find that so many times it's just easier to do nothing. Well, to be nothing is to be neutral. And to be neutral means that you're headed for an accident. You know, there's all kinds of accidents in the world, and they're not usually pleasant motorcycle accidents, car accidents, accident here, accidental death, accidental shooting, accident, accident, accident. I want to be on purpose. And we can be on purpose in the word of God. We can put a brick in the wall. We can hold a sword in hand and be prepared to wield that sword at any minute. We can pay attention and walk circumspect as the Holy Spirit commands us to do. Pay attention. If you were in the wilderness walking on a trail, you'd pay attention lest you get bit by a rattlesnake. Pay attention. For the serpent links near, he roams around like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour, the ones that don't pay attention, the ones who are not on purpose, the ones who refuse to make a decision. Choose this day who you serve. Choose this day who you serve. So that is our pretty much fast version of week one recap. This is what God is, is doing here. And I know God's doing something where you're at. And I know that, that, that what God is doing where you're at is a blessing to me. I love hearing about it. I want to hear more. I, I long to hear those guys that come out, those guys that are kind of keeping it to themselves because they say that, you know what, that I'm not a preacher. I beg to differ. The word of God says, if you're born again, you got a testimony. I'll call that good preaching. You're saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Revelation 12, 11. Let me say it again. You're saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. God don't make no mistakes in his word. So we testify and your testimony is valid of Yeshua in your life because it brings strength to the brethren. It's like sharing in a buffet. It's like a, a family reunion. It's like coming together. And what God has given us now is technology to do these things. I'm encouraging you with the word that came out of paradise this week. Week one, we played an opponent that was bigger. I don't know about faster. We're pretty quick. But they were bigger, and they passed the eye test. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of proud looks whenever we walked off the bus. But that look changed, and the God of heaven of all creation was glorified. I'm not speaking to you that every week you're going to get the opportunity to, to win on the scoreboard on a football field, but you will get the opportunity to win on the scoreboard in heaven. I truly believe that your life is being, being recorded in heaven. As this video is being recorded, I believe that you're being recorded. Now, I want to share a few scriptures with you about choice. God is a God of choice. He is love. He does not have love. He is love. And love gives. Lust takes. And we have so 
much of a tendency sometimes as coaches to be so competitive minded that we want to take, 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 so we can re divvy up that we can get what we want. You got to let people choose. If God gives choices, who am I to take those choices? But I want to encourage to make the right choice. And it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, but we have the mind of Christ. Having the mind of Christ doesn't always stop hearing false information. It simply gives you a choice. I'm not moved by what the world says. I'm not moved by what I see in these eyes, but I'm moved by what I believe. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm not touchy-feely. I'm moved by what I believe. The Bible says that my sheep know my voice and a stranger's voice they shall not follow. The indication is that there'll be two voices. You'll hear the voice of the enemy of the world. I believe the voice of the flesh, which may be more. And you'll hear the voice of the good shepherd. And the good shepherd will always lead you according to his word. If it's not according to the word, no matter how good it seems, it's not the word of God. And the Bible clearly tells us in 1 John at the back, it says, test every spirit. Tested by the word of God. The word of God stands true. The Bible says that God exalts his word above his name. The next verse I have for you is Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. I said, let this mind be in you. That's a choice. That's called being on purpose. That's called when you're getting up in the morning, I'm going to be on purpose and go pray. I'm going to be on purpose and I'm going to get me a word of the day. And if, and if I have a tendency to forget that word, I'm going to write it on my arm. I'm going to put it on a, on a little note card. I'm going to put it on a piece of paper. I'm going to put it in the notes of my phone and I'm going to refer to it every five minutes until it's burnt into my thinking processes. This is the mind of Christ. I choose the word of God, which is the mind of Christ. I choose the word of God. And first Peter four, one says, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh that we should arm ourselves, pick up your sword. We had a sword in our hand and a brick in another. You see, we're building a wall. We're building a wall to protect the things that God has given us to protect our salvation. We're, we're building a wall to guard our hearts, but we have sword in hand that we may wield that sword that other souls may be touched, cut, and make a decision for the Lord Yeshua. That is our testimony. That is our life. And I'm going to tell you something. How blessed are you to have a vehicle called football to win souls? Now, let me ask you this. Are you driving that vehicle? Are you allowing God to use that vehicle? And you're saying, well, I'm not more powerful than God. True. But let me go back to where we started at. Be on purpose. Make a decision. Make a choice. God always gives man a choice. He says, choose life. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you'll serve. And of course, they said that they would serve the Lord, but they did not. And I'm going to tell you the power of a coach and having this order of the word of God on his team. I'm going to liken it to Israel. If you were to sit here and tell me that every godly king that came through Israel, let's go to Judah because I my mind goes to more godly kings in Judah. If you're going to tell me that everybody in Judah loved the Lord, then I'm going to have to tell you you're wrong. I just, it doesn't make sense. But here's what I will tell you. They obeyed the king the leader, the head of the nation. They obeyed the king. And when they obeyed the king, God, God brought great prosperity and blessing to Judah. But when there was no order, when the king went wayward, when the king didn't establish some rules, some government, you see, the, the kingdom of God may not be a good place for everybody because there's not, some of the things that you're in love with ain't going to be there. And you're not going to tell God or get to vote God and change the rule and order of God's word. The Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Heaven and earth may be shaken, but my word will remain. The word of God is rule and God is grace. God is love. He's demonstrated that love by stepping down from his throne before the foundation of the world. He determined these things to die on the cross and rise from the dead, but it must be received. And if you love God, according to Yeshua, he said, if you love me, you would obey me. I'm giving you the word of God. Choose life. Choose the word of God. Let this mind be in you. Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourself with this mind, the mind that was in Christ. 
And I'm going to tell you that being armed with the mind of Christ may bring persecution, tribulation, and trial. Let me rephrase that. It will. How do I know that? Because Christ didn't say maybe. He said you will be persecuted. He said they hated me, they'll hate you also. Who are they? Those of the world. And unfortunately, I've played some Christian football teams before. And I'll tell you what, man, I'm not a bit surprised. Matter of fact, we learned some cuss words. We learned some foul behavior. I'm, I'm gonna, let me say this, because this is kind of cut. This is in my gourd today a little bit. Just got in there. Don't you dare kneel down and pray before a football game and then go out there and ask, act like devils. You know what? I tell my kids all the time. I say, we're fixing to pray. And we get a word like the one I'm giving you right now before we go out. But let me tell you something. If you're not going to back that up, make a choice to stand on the word instead of your foul flesh, the devil who's going to try to entice you through adversity, if you're not going to do it, don't pray with us. I'll respect your decision. I may not agree with it, but I'll respect it. I don't want, we don't need any more imitation fake stuff in this world. We need some men of God that will stand, act like men. What is a man? Go study Jesus. Go study the men of old, the word of God. Act like men. We're going to act like men according to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We're going to stand up. We're going to pray. We're going to fight. We're going to be watchmen on the wall. We're going to carry a sword in hand, the word of God. And we're going to be willing to work because a man that won't work shouldn't eat. And we're going to testify the word of God in everywhere that we go. We're going to bring our talents and all of our abilities because I believe that we've got too many, too many self-proclaiming, self-diagnosed Christians that are walking limp-wristed and trying to fit into the world instead of change the world. It's my job to raise my children. It's my job to take care of my boys. It's my job to preach the gospel to those God has given me. And if you're a mom or dad, it's your job. But together, we can be in agreement on this. Remember growing up, my son, who's watching this video, he better be, who got him a victory on Friday night as well. Thank God. Praise God. Praise God. Two victories, both scoreboards, heaven and earth. And I remember that it, we had these conversations every day. He had to go to school with me, played football for me. And I remember he wanted to go to some youth meetings with his friends. And I pray that your youth meetings are not like this. I don't know your situation. But I knew inside that I'd raised him right and I taught him the right things. And I wasn't going to throw him to the wolves. But it was real quick that he came back and he said, Dad, I don't want to go anymore. All these things are about are about pizza, meeting up with your friends, shooting baskets, youth ministers dressing up like weirdos, like superheroes. I mean, if Jesus is not your, and I, I don't even like using that word, if he's not enough, you got to dress up like Batman and Robin to entice kids. If the word of God is not enough, why are we gathering? It's okay to gather, but let's call it something else. Let's not call it church. Let's not call it uh, time with the Lord. We need brokenness. We need the spirit of God to fall. I was invited to a youth meeting one time to preach. I came in and I thought I was in a mosh pit. Walls black, people banging into each other. There were two, two youth ministers there, probably a couple of hundred youth. They said, Coach, we want you to talk to our youth. I got up there and I was struggling because I knew the Lord had, had put on my heart what I was seeing wasn't of, the, wasn't of God. When I got up, I preached the gospel and I corrected that foul behavior, the ignorance, bringing the world into what they called the church. You see, if it smells like the world, it looks like the world, it is the world. God don't need the world to win the lost. Matter of fact, the world needs to be removed that the lost may be won. There has to be a separation. There has to be a sanctification, and few understand this. Now, God is able to clean that one up. We don't wait on that process, but understand, this needed to be corrected. This Under leadership, this should not have been going on. These young men and young ladies should have been taught what it means to come and feast on the manna from heaven to fellowship with your little brothers and sisters. What it means to worship is not some bang, bang music where you're slamming your head against the wall, creating ignorance. The Holy Spirit does not come in to create chaos. 
And so often we see that churches have become a place to where they look more like a bar room. You know, yeah, I've been in a few of them. I repented and got saved. Maybe some of the ones that have grown up in the faith, so they say, need to go visit so they can see how much danger they're in. I ain't trying to, listen, if this don't minister to you, praise God. I'm just speaking. This is the word God has given me. You want one, you're next. Praise God. Give your word. Amen. Let me move on from there. Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed, metamorpho, metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that your life is literally changed. One of the first things the kids told me when I repented 21 years ago, they said, coach, what happened? I didn't even know what to tell them at that time. God said, tell them what I'm doing in you. You understand that. And I began to grow as I began to share and be obedient to God. But they said, something happened. You don't look the same and your language ain't nothing like what it used to be. Coach, what happened? At that moment in an inner city school, word time began. Hundreds of kids began to come. Parents began to bring food. We gathered in a high school weight room. The gospel was preached. I didn't know anything but the blood, the cross, and the Holy Spirit. I knew nothing else. Yet I realize now that's all that's needed. I said that's all that's needed. Repentance and faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's going to take the same faith that saved you. For, for you're not saved by works, lest any man should boast. You're saved through faith, the grace by faith that God has given you. Romans 12, 3, he's given every man the measure of faith. It is that same faith that will help you walk in sanctification. It is that same faith that, that activates the power of the Holy Spirit in you to wield your sword, to put a brick in one hand and a sword in the other. The same faith that takes to go out on the field. Unfortunately, we many don't understand sanctification. Salvation, we understand that. But we don't understand sanctification, which makes me wonder if we really understand salvation. It's not check in, get your old pass, and you get to go to heaven. No, it's check in, and now go to work. You see, I didn't work to get saved, but now that I'm saved, God puts me to work. And that work is a sword in my hand and a brick in the other, building walls, preaching the gospel, standing, fighting, being a watchman on the wall, paying attention, and letting nothing come out of my mouth but the word of God. Meditate this book of the law continually. Let it not depart from you. Let nothing else come out of your mouth. You see, a lot of people think that means that you don't preach the gospel. What it's saying is let it not come out of your mouth. In other words, always have a word of God in your mouth. Just clean that up, didn't I? CST was pretty good, Coach Shelby translation. That's what it means. Study the word out. Understand the word. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, my inward man is being renewed day by day. My inward man is being renewed day by day. Let the spirit of God renew you, but make that choice. Be on purpose. Make a decision. Choose this day whom you serve. And this week, as we go into our second game, listen, guys, I'm praying for you. You know, we're praying for Millsap. Praise God. Thank you, my brother there. God bless you, man. You're a blessing to us, man. Keep on keeping on. Keep on. When we come together here in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a Holy Ghost revival. I'm praying for my brothers at Alvord. Derek, get up. Nathan, get up. Let's go. Coach Gerg, let's go. I know there's more. I, I know that there's more in there. I see my other brothers. I'm praying for all of you, man. I'm praying for, for Coach Johnson. I'm praying for, for Coach Smiley and, and Coach McCoy. Are there other brothers there? Let them join us. I know it's tough right now, but the toughness is this is the place God has placed you for a time such as this. There's only two kinds of people, people that are facing adversity and people that are fixing to. If, if you're a man of God, you're fixing to, or you're already in it, but he's trusted you to be right where you're at for a time such as this, because those souls need to hear the gospel. That coaching staff needs to hear the gospel. Coach Shaw, where are you at? Coach Shaw, man, this man came aboard hard and fast, filled with the word of God and knowledge. I pray the wisdom of God be upon you today, brother. And that right there in Valley View, man, that, it, that there'd be a resurrection injection by the power of the Holy Spirit. And even as Valley View and my son come together, I've, I've got two sons. One on each staff. I'm praying for more. 
I'm talking about in the faith, and I think you understand that, guys. Praying for my brother, Coach Langley, NCTC. Likes to hit golf balls. What a blessing he was to me at Sanger. The, the, the years of sharpening swords sitting beside each other. The years of acting like big kids, of harassing each other, but then buckling down and getting serious in the word of God. If I missed anybody, I apologize. If there are others, tell me who you are. Colt, now your daddy. Your daddy is a blessing here, man. Colt, I think I said Colton. <laughs> your blessing over at Mineral Wells. You got Brother Jake right down the road from you, man. The Holy Ghost is over there. The Holy Ghost train runs right through Mineral Wells, man. I'm praying for you, believing for you, brother. Standing with you. Grow up. Learn more than football. Learn God's ways. Because in his ways lies all success. Lies the peace that passes all understanding. Make a choice. Choose this day who you serve. Pacer, praise God, one of the athletes there at Austin College. Act like a man. Be a man. Stand up. Listen, I ain't questioning anybody's name I'm bringing up. I'm just thinking about your names. I'm telling you what you ought to be telling me. And you probably are. Pray for me. I need it. I ain't young anymore. I ain't old either. I don't know what that means. I feel different. Praise God. But I ain't moved by what I feel. I move by what I believe. We love you guys, man. We're praying for you. Send this, 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 this video wherever. Send those videos you're making wherever because the word of God will not return to him void. Nathan, man. DC, congratulations over to Alvord, man. You held him to 12 points. Praise God. Good job. Good job. Good job, man. But that still is not even an evaluation of you. You're being evaluated by the blood of the lamb, which washes away all sin. Stand and stand therefore. Congratulations, Coach Gerg. I saw you guys running down the sidelines, shoulder checking each other, by the way. Praise God. Anyway, I'm rambling right here. I just want you to know, guys, that I care about you guys. We're praying for you. I know many of these other men are. Coach Johnson, man, praise the Lord. Blessing. I could go on and on and on. Coach Ryle. I could go on and on and on with name after name after name after name. But you got the idea. We've got to hold each other up because just like when, when Nehemiah was building the wall, they were of one accord. They had a man to stand together and they stood on the word of God. Ezra came in and read the word of God to him. I like Ezra too. He had some good things to say. Matter of fact, Ezra, I kind of relate with. I think he got up and ripped out some of their hair and punched some of them because they were marrying pagans. He said, that ought not be so, ain't happening. I'm going like, Lord, woo, glory. Don't let me read that one before the game. Me punching somebody in the eye, ripping out the hair, saying, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Oh, Lord. And then I remembered, he said, your, the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty. That was the Old Testament. So we're supposed to rip out the hair, punch them in the jaw spiritually by praying for them. Give the devil a black eye. Praise God. Come on. The choke hold on the devil. Shut his mouth, bind him in the name of Yeshua. Whatsoever shall be bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. I shall stomp on scorpions and serpents according to the work, the, the word in Luke 10 and 19. Yeshua said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He has no authority. You have the authority if you're in Christ Jesus. He has given, he has given assignments, but those assignments, I mean, could you imagine? Let me give you this. I'm, I'm going to leave, I promise. Could you imagine somebody hiring you say, I'm going to give you an assignment, but I'm going to give those that you give the assignment over the power to destroy your assignment. You, in other words, you're going to lose every assignment. If they choose to know the truth and to walk in the truth, you're going to lose. You probably wouldn't take that job. You probably wouldn't take that. Hey, listen, I know you're a great coach, but you come in here, but you are never, ever, ever going to want to win a game because I always give the other team the authority to overcome you. You understand that that's what Jesus did. You will face some adversity. And I know you may be thinking about Job, but he had twice as much in the end as he did in the beginning. There's a lot of things I don't understand in the word of God. I don't understand all the details of that, but it that's how it wound up. And in the end, Paul was beheaded, but he saw Yeshua face to face. You see, you're guaranteed to win. What the devil can't take from you is that salvation if you'll stay anchored in the cross of Christ and faith exclusively in him. And if you'll do that, 
the how the power of the Holy Spirit, if you will allow him and ask him, will move through you to walk through these adverse situations and to help you be a witness right now, Romans 12, 11, in the place that God has got you. He's got you there to win souls. That's the reason you're there. Bless God. Praise God. We love you guys. Hear from you soon. Keep the videos coming. Let's encourage each other in the Lord. I don't say good luck because that's witchcraft. I say God bless you. See the difference? God bless you according to the word of God. God's will be done. Amen? Praise God.